morning, everyone. How are you this morning? It's been a good morning this morning. Great worship. Good time as a church family to come together. <clears throat> Excuse me. While walking through a forest one day, a man found a young eagle that had fallen out of its nest. He took it home and put it in his barnyard where it soon learned to eat and behave like the chickens. Well, one day a naturalist came by, passed by the farm and asked why it was that the king of the birds should be confined to live in a barnyard with the chickens. The farmer replied that since it had grown up with the chickens, it had been fed by the chicken food, with chicken food, it had been trained with the chickens, it acted like a chicken, therefore it was a chicken. And since it now behaved like the chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, the man replied. Surely it can be taught to fly. So he lifted the eagle towards the sky and he said, You belong to the sky, not to the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. Well, the eagle, however, was confused. He didn't know who he was. And seeing the chickens there eating their chicken feed, he hopped down to be with them again. Well, the naturalist took the bird, the eagle, and he took it to the roof of a house and he urged him again from the roof of the house saying, you are an eagle, stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and he jumped down once more to the chicken food. Well, finally, the naturalist, he took that eagle. He took the eagle out of the barnyard to a high mountain and there he held the king of the birds above and encouraged him saying, you are an eagle, you belong to the sky, stretch forth your wings and fly. Well, the eagle, it looked around, it looked back towards the barnyard, and then it looked up towards the sky. And the naturalist, he, he held the bird towards the sun, and it happened that the eagle began to tremble. And slowly he stretched forth his wings, and with a triumphant cry, he soared away into the heavens. Now, it may be that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. It may be that he may even occasionally visit the barnyard. But as far as anyone knows, he's never returned to live the life of a chicken. I want you to hold on to that illustration as we go through this passage of Scripture. And if you have your Bibles with you right now, open them up. We're going to a wonderful, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. We're going to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and this morning we're starting a new series that I'm very excited about because this series is about our identity, who we are as believers. And Paul gives us one of the most brilliant descriptions of our identity in Ephesians 2. I'm going to read for you this passage of Scripture from the New Living Bible. New Living Translation, and uh, you can follow along with me. Paul says, once you were dead because of your disobedience, your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. And by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God, he's so rich in mercy, he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it's only by grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages to examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as he's shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done so that none of us can boast. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Heavenly Father, as we delve into your word, God, teach us. Teach us, I know you have a message for each and every one of us. 
God, you care for us so deeply that you want us to grow in our relationship with you. So, Lord, I ask that you move in a powerful way this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, Paul begins this powerful description, this passage of Scripture, describing life without Jesus. He describes it as death, as a spiritual death without God, basically meaningless, hardly worth living. He says it's a separation from God. It's, it's a life alienated from the life of God. And he says because of humanity's actions and behaviors, he calls these things disobedience and he calls these things sin. And these Greek words, the words that Paul uses basically mean the same thing. One means missing the mark. The other one means a falling away from. So Paul is telling this, his audience here that because of the relationship that they have, because of the consequences of their sin, there is no relationship with God. And there's only distorted relationships with those around them. And tragically, all are powerless to do anything about it. So Paul's purpose is to give us an idea, a life without God or a life with God in Christ Jesus. And when Paul uses this word live, as in, you used to live in sin, what he's saying here is a way of life. You used to have a way of life. Paul is using this word to describe going about your life according to any authority, any authority other than God in your life. The great evangelical theologian John Stott, he describes this authority as a whole value system which is alien to God. It permeates, indeed dominates, non-Christian society and holds people in captivity. Wherever human beings are dehumanized by political oppression or bureaucratic tyranny or by outlook that is secular, amoral, materialistic, by poverty, by hunger, by unemployment, by racial discrimination or any form of injustice, there we can detect the subhuman values of this age, this world. You see, Paul is saying here that everyone, each and every one of us, has tried to find meaning in life at some point in our life, one way or another, without God. Max Licato wrote in his book, Unshakable Hope, he said, children have a tendency to say, look at me. On a tricycle, look at me go. On a trampoline, look at me bounce. On a swing set, look at me swing. And such behavior is acceptable for children. Yet many adults spend their grown-up years saying the same thing. They say, look at me drive this fancy car. Look at me make money. Look at me wear provocative clothing, use big words, or flex my big muscles. Look at me. Max says, isn't it time we grew up? We were made to live a life that says, look at God. So people are to look at us and not see us, but the image of our maker. That's God's plan. We all have a past. We all have things in our lives that we're ashamed of, things that we are embarrassed about, things we wish never happened in our life. We're all a people with a past marked with disobedience and failure. And it demonstrates that there's something wrong in each and every one of us at the core of our very being. And none of us can escape the charge. We're all geared towards self, towards self-centeredness, whether we make this obvious to others or we hide it from others. And because of those things, our identity is determined by sin, the rest of the world, and the devil, Paul says. We're controlled by our sinful desires, those reasonings, we are controlled by these things that cause a living death. So Paul demands that we take sin more seriously. Sin cannot be thought of as merely an act of the individual that only affects the individual. Rather, you think of sin as the powers of the unseen world that try to dominate our perspectives, that try to dominate our actions, that try to dominate who you are. The world in which we live, it brands us with assumptions, with assumptions of character. And Paul longed for all, us to for all of us to be delivered from that attitude. Have you ever wondered, 
Have you ever wondered why Germany became so widely deceived by Nazism? You know, it's not because the German people were more sinful than others. It was because there was a whole self-seeking order that grew up in the chaos of a depression and deceived millions and even millions in the church. The German people, they were seeking what we all seek. They wanted security. They wanted respect. They wanted prosperity. Have you ever wondered why there's racism in this world? Have you ever wondered why we're so materialistic and why sexuality now has been so distorted around us? It's because the good in this world has become so distorted by a world, by, by a system that leaves God out of the picture, which is what sin always does. Isaiah's confession is really descriptive of us all. It says in Isaiah 6, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You see, sin is personal. It is individual, but it's also corporate. And it tries to manipulate people to tell them that there is good in this world without the need of God. And our challenge as believers each and every day is that we live in these two overlapping worlds. Though a new life exists in Christ, our old world is still at work around us. And so that begs the question, which realm will define your identity? Verses two and three describe what was formerly true of us. But for some of us, that's still a reality. A break from the past has not been realized. We're attracted to the glitz and the glory all around the world. And if you remember, remember from the opening story, remember the barnyard. You know, it's, easily, it's easy to relate and to understand people who don't know God that are living in this living death. But how can we, who have found life and freedom in Christ Jesus, be led back towards death? So let's be honest with one another and let's be perfectly clear. The world wants to define you, to define who you are, who you should be. And if the desires of Christians are the same as the desires of the world, and those desires are filled in the same word, in the same way, then the gospel is worthless. It's useless. Christians must always distinguish between life without God and life with God. Because the world says, you know what? You're not good enough. You need to look better. You need to dress better. You need that surgery. You need to be perfect. But God says to each and every one of us, he says, you're wonderful. He says in Psalm 139, you made me, you made me all the delicate parts, my innermost parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. You are marvelous. The world says, you don't have enough. You need a better job. You need a bigger house. You need a nicer car. You need a bigger bank account. You need more. You've got to have more, more. And God says to you, you're rich. 2 Corinthians 9, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And the world says, it's all about you. Love yourself. You come first. You deserve all the things that you need in your life. You deserve praise. You deserve honor. You deserve glory. And God turns it around. He says, it's all about me. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. All these things, you will have everything you need. So if Jesus is Lord, sin is and the obedience to the powers of the unseen world are not your identities. As believers, we must and consistently say no to the world's persistent attempts to define who we are. Well, let me continue on in verse 4. 
I love this part. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it's only by grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. And so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ. Friends, Jesus identifies with us. He identifies with humanity He becomes one with humanity to take on the penalty that we deserve because of our brokenness. And when we accept Christ as our Savior and are baptized into Jesus, we identify with Christ's death and his resurrection, and we live out our lives as a reflection of Christ's sacrifice. Christianity, it's not primarily about a religion of ideas, but it's a relationship it's a, relation, it's a religion of participation, of involvement, and fellowship with God and with Christ and his people. Christians are called into fellowship with God's Son, who has been crucified, and we have been baptized into his death. We have put off the world, and we have put on Christ himself, and we'll be united with him in his resurrection. Jesus is victorious. We sung about that this morning. Jesus is victorious, and his victory is our victory, not the world who determines our identity. Verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. So you need to understand this. I don't know where you're from, where you're coming from. You may not think you're worthy of love. You may not feel loved right now. You may not even love yourself right now. But I can stand here and tell you directly, absolutely and unequivocally, that God loves each and every one of you here, right now. For the mercy and the love of God are revelations of God's innate character. They're not a response to something that we've said or done. God acts in mercy towards us because that's who he is, not what he does. And he's not only merciful to us, he's not only merciful showing pity to those who are unworthy and undeserving, but he's rich in that mercy, rich in displaying mercy. And there's a longing in the heart of God for each and every one of you. And so much so that Paul continues in verse 5, he says, That even though we were dead, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead, for it's only by grace that you have been saved. God again shows and displays this extreme love, this, this free, undeserved favor to each and every one of us, all those around us. For in his death, he suffered for our sins, and he removed that barrier, that barrier in our relationship between us and God that sin had caused in each of our lives. And by his resurrection, he shows that there is triumph over death, both physical and spiritual. And Paul wanted to be crystal clear here when he used that word saved. He used the tense, the perfect tense of the verb. And he said it means to be saved. It's a completed action. It's continuous and it's permanent. And so that means you have been saved from your sins. You are being saved from your sins. You will be saved from your sins. And amazing and as wonderful that is, there's more to this. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. See, Paul is explaining to us in a wonderful way that when God raised Christ from the dead, he exalted him, raised him, and exalted us as well. And he says more specifically that our lives are now a reflection of that love, a reflection of Christ enthroned. So our identity now, our identity is in heaven. Our identity is now in heaven, not under the authority of this world, nor the conformity to its standards. 
And Paul celebrates this. He celebrates the life believers now have in Christ. Because with the life you have in Christ comes privilege, becomes honor, becomes security and purpose in in our lives. Why does God love us so much? Why does he care so much about us? Have you ever wondered that? Well, Ephesians 7 goes on to say, so God can point to you can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. You see, it's so that, so that through us, through you, God can display forever, without doubt, who God is. Professor Kyle Snodgrass brilliantly states, he says, the purpose of God for his church, as Paul came to understand it, reaches beyond itself, beyond the salvation, the enlightenment, and the recreation of individuals, beyond its unity and fellowship, beyond even the witness to the world. The church is to be the exhibition of the whole creation of the wisdom and the love and the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Wonderful. And then Paul goes on to give us the best description of salvation. Verse 8, you have been saved by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift freely given to you. This grace, this wonderful, amazing grace means completely undeserved. And it's a loving commitment of God to us, his commitment to us. For some reason, unbeknownst to us, which is rooted in God's nature, God gives himself to us. He attaches himself to us and he acts. And even though we deserve punishment, even though we deserve separation from God, we receive mercy and grace instead. This grace, this action of God is rooted in his nature. Christians are saved. People are saved by God's grace, not by their faith. Faith is only the means by which grace is received. And equally important, so important, faith cannot be just a mental exercise, a mental decision, a belief in something or a certain idea. Because Paul uses a very specific noun here for faith. It really means faithfulness. It means reliability. It means a promise or a pledge. It means proof. It means trust. It means confidence. So people who believe in Christ do not merely accept Christ intellectually, but they're bound to live for God in response to that grace and mercy we receive. So Paul frequently uses this phrase, he says, in Christ or with Christ, to show his conviction that faith joins them to Christ so strongly that they are, they are in him. And what is true about Jesus is true about us. Christ's past is our past. And Christ's future determines our future. Faith binds us as believers in Christ. And salvation doesn't come from believing an idea. It's not an emotional decision. It's being bound to Christ. Faith is relational, and it's describing reliance on a reliable God. And faith is a covenant word. Remember this, a covenant word. Expressing commitment, expressing trust, that binds God and believers together. It's throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture, God, by His grace, He makes promises and commits Himself to us. And we, in turn, are to trust those promises and live in light of those promises. God shows Himself faithful to us, and we as a people are to respond to Him in faithfulness. And then Paul continues his description of salvation. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. 
So none of us can boast about it. Now, sadly, many of us stop at this point. We stop reading. But Paul concludes with this this, uh, proclamation. He says, we are God's workmanship in some of your verses, in some of your translations. But I love this. For we are God's masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned long ago. So I want to be clear, people don't contribute to their rebirth, their spiritual rebirth, any more than their natural birth. They're the result of God's activity. The only right attitude, the only possible attitude for men and women before their maker and judge is repentance, dependence, and obedience. Their only pride can be in the cross and in Jesus Christ who suffered there. And that being said, there's a really important distinction that Paul makes between what some believe in the church. See, Paul's belief, his idea of belief or faith in verse verse 8 includes attachment and unity with Christ. And unfortunately, some people feel that belief or faith only means acceptance. It's only a decision. It's only a teaching that one agrees with. Where Paul says belief and faith It's life-changing. It produces good works. For many, however, change is desirable with belief or faith, but it's not really necessary, is it? So ask yourself, does the verse, salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, does it mean that we don't have to do anything good ever? Is a decision the right prayer prayed, a hand raised. Is that enough for salvation? How did belief in Christ get diluted into thoughts about Christ? How did the focus for many believers get placed on the destination of heaven and not the journey along the way? How can anyone read the New Testament and conclude We don't have to do anything once we're saved. We're saved. Well, let me illustrate. Identity drives motivation. Motivation drives action, and action drives results. So if I'm going home from church today and somebody passes me doing 80, odds are I'm not gonna chase them down and give them a ticket. I don't have the identity, I'm not a police officer, and so I don't have that motivation to act. A police officer, on the other hand, does have that identity, does have that motivation for action, and will get results. Friends, faith or belief in Christ affects a new creation in us, and it propels us to do good things, the things that God foreordained before. Faithfulness in Christian living isn't an optional part of our faith. But let me be perfectly clear, salvation is not from works, but surely it is for works. That is living obediently and productively for God. Again, I want to quote John Stott. He said, good works are indispensable to salvation, not as a grounds or means, but as its consequence, as evidence. Humanity was created by God, and it was good. But that work, his work, was spoilt by our actions. A new divine act of creation was needed, and Jesus proclaims, he proclaims in John 3, you must be born again. And Paul concludes this passage by saying, he has created us anew in Christ, so we can do the good things he planned long ago. We are God's masterpiece. Not to be created like a painting and hung on a wall for people to see, but a warm, a living, a breathing, an acting reflection of God in all his glory that moves and has its purpose in Christ. Ephesians 10 says, salvation is not from good works, but it's for good works. For God saves his people 
so that they can live productively lives in keeping with God intended so long ago. And with good works, Paul wasn't talking about goodism, good, good, do, do goodism, do goodism, do goodism. That's the word. But it's a life reflective of the love of God to those around us, to reflect God's love to your neighbors. Every action we take in this life has a sense of identity behind it. Everything you do identifies who you are. And an authentic rebirth, it proves itself in good works. Good works are involved in this new life as an inseparable part of who we are. And Jesus said that. He said in John 15, he said, Yes, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will produce much good fruit. And just as the fruit of the branch are predetermined by the vine, so our good works are a result of our rebirth and union with Christ who is in our lives. So let me encourage you as you go about this week. Our identity is not determined by who the world claims we are or who we need to be. Our identity is determined by the realm of Christ. Our identity is not determined by a world of sin, of death. Our identity is in Christ who conquered sin and death. Our identity isn't determined in the world. Our identity is determined with Christ in heaven. Amen? Our identity is determined by life in and with Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love your word. And I love your people. Lord, help them this week to remember they are a masterpiece. And for those who haven't made that commitment to Christ, I pray for them. I pray for them that they would make that decision to know Jesus, to know him more, and to love him and to live for him. Father, bless us as your people as we go about May we bless the world around us with Christ's likeness. Lord, when we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror, God, may we see Christ. Father, bless us now as your people. And may you be blessed forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or even imagine through his beautiful power that's at work within us. Be glory in this church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and evermore. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Bless you. Have a great week.